In the early 1900s, the Lozier vehicle was born from a humble beginning. It all started with boats, but destiny had grander plans for this remarkable company. Henry Abraham Lozier was an Indiana-born sewing machine and bicycle manufacturer. After selling his bicycle business, Lozier moved to Plattsburgh to manufacture boats and marine engines. Okay, I'm standing next to a 1915 Lozier Type 82 touring car. Every story has a beginning and it has an end, and this is the end of the story of Lozier. Uh, the Lozier company started producing automobiles in 1905. Uh, they produced uh, cars in Plattsburgh here from 1905, exclusively between 1911 and 1913, uh, when most of the car production ended here. Detroit plant started in 1910. They actually, the first car actually came out in 1911, and they produced cars uh, right up until 1915. We are here right now in the Lozier Gallery. The Lozier Gallery, uh, I designed it and uh, laid all this, uh, these photographs out because we were trying to tell the story of the name Lozier. The Lozier company uh, established themselves here in Plattsburgh to build boats uh, down where the current Georgia Pacific plant is. They built boats for the first five years and then they decided to switch to automobiles. The unique thing is that these cars were the most expensive cars in the world at the time they were built, starting in 1905. A typical car you would have seen back there, they were, they were just coming out. Cars were in the $1,000 range. Uh, the Lozier started at five to $6,000. They were well beyond the price of a house, almost double the cost of the average house. So it's kind of interesting that a little town like Plattsburgh is producing the most spectacular automobile in the world. In 1910, Lozier unveiled their masterpiece the Model 77, a car renowned for its unmatched luxury and engineering sophistication. The Model 77 stole the spotlight at international auto shows, mesmerizing the world with its beauty and performance. The story really goes back to uh, the late 1800s. Uh, in the 1800s, Mr. Lozier uh, was originally a salesman for sewing machines. Uh, he changed from that to being in a manufacturer of sewing machines, uh, then to bicycles, and then suddenly uh, the bicycle business was starting to get saturated by a lot of different companies. Uh, and so what he decided to do is to get into a different form of manufacturing, that was marine engines and boats. So I had mentioned uh, Mr. Lozier was uh, very much obsessed with quality and he was concerned that anything that had this Lozier name on it would be of the highest quality. Uh, also, one of the things that goes with that is a very high price, and uh, he wasn't worried about the price as long as that quality was in there. Lozier's were top-line luxury cars, and for a time, were the most expensive cars produced in the United States. The 1910 model featured cars priced between $4,600 and $7,750. That same year, a Cadillac could be bought for about $1,600 and a Packard for about $3,200. Our museum is home to two of them. Cars that were built from 1905 to 1910 are very, very rare. Of the 3,000 cars built, uh, that we know of only around 43 to 44 cars exist today. So to have two of those uh, here at the museum, it's very interesting. His wife, uh, Mary, was an elegant lady. Some people wonder if they stayed here in Plattsburgh. They weren't here very long. Uh, he came here to Plattsburgh to find out how the local people would be interested in, in having a factory here. Uh, when he sold the company, uh, he came here initially to Plattsburgh because George Burwell, the uh, superintendent of his manufacturing plant, had previously worked here in Plattsburgh. So he came and he met with the local luminaries in the city. He wanted to find out if people here were interested in getting involved in the company before he would put all this money into it because you, you need uh, local support. And so that's exactly what he did. He came in and he had mentioned things that, he would be need, that would needed to be done. And uh, one of the things was they had to build a dam. So he said, I'll build the dam if you can supply enough money. 
uh, to offset some of the other costs that are involved. So what he ended up doing, local people actually raised a pledge of 166,000. Uh, the uh, car features an onboard air compressor. So if you do speak in the tires, if you have to blow your tire up for some reason, uh, you can blow them right up with the engine itself. There's a connector right in. Open the hood, start the engine up, and you can blow up your tires. You can also assist someone else uh, with their tires. Um, the car also features a, an oil reservoir that has a level indicator in it. All you have to do is look at it. I don't have to get your hands dirty when you have to add oil to the car. This particular car here is a five passenger automobile. You can see that it's left hand drive. This is one of the first switchovers. All cars were right drive until the Ford Model T was introduced in 1908. And then very slowly cars began to be left drive. We drove on the right side, just like we do today. But that's one of the characteristics of early cars. So you'll see a variety of left and right. Quite a powerful engine, a very large six cylinder engine. Uh, doesn't get very good mileage as compared to what we would see today, but people that could afford this car really didn't worry about the mileage at the time. It's approximately 450 cubic inches. Uh, it's set up with two sets of uh, cylinders. There's three in the front, three in the back. Uh, the car has the, the magneto system right in here. Uh, to check your oil on a modern car, you usually have to, I don't care if you even have a Rolls Royce, you need a paper towel uh, to check your oil. You open up the hood, uh, you put the dipstick in. And the loader, all you have to do is look at this gauge right here. This little gauge tells you the amount of oil in the engine. You don't have to get your hands dirty. And then if you have to add oil, right there, that little breather, you open that up and you put your oil in right over there. You notice the horn is here. This is a Claxton type horn which was typically used on cars of the era. It makes a sound that sounds like uh oh ga basically is what it sounds like. If you wonder what those little cups are on the top, those are what they call priming cups. So if the car sits all winter long and you go to start it, today you'd have to use some ether or something to start it. All you do on here is pull this little valve over and you put just a little, couple drops of gasoline in each one of these six uh, cups. Now when you go start the car, it will fire right up even after a long winter sleep. Right around 1900, the factory was not ready to produce anything at that point. They had already designed an engine. John Perrin uh, had been researching lots of products, uh, in particular ball bearings. Ball bearings uh, make anything rotating a lot easier to rotate, more efficient, and uh, they work a lot better, and they're far more dependable than anything without roller bearings. So in 1900, uh, they moved into the Plattsburgh Shirt Factory. Believe it or not, there was a factory located down where the local police department is now currently, down right along the river, where they got the, the power supply from the river. Uh, and they started building these engines. They made a small foundry there. So uh, manufacturing started here in Plattsburgh. Uh, Mr. Lozier moved to New York City. He had a beautiful apartment in the Waldorf Astoria with his wife. Uh, and he set up a showroom along the East River. And the idea would be that you come into the showroom, you look at these motors and stuff that were available, and guess what? There were a bunch of boats built in Plattsburgh ready to take a ride. Unfortunately, 1903 was not a good year for the Lozier Company because Henry Lozier, the founder, uh, became ill. One morning he got up uh, after breakfast, he wasn't feeling well. He told his wife that he was going to lay back down again. Now, this was not what Mr. Lozier was doing. He was a very much a driven man, and he was uh, up and going every single day. Uh, after he laid down, uh, his wife went to check on him, and he was dead. He had passed away from a massive heart attack. So the company was all of a sudden left without their leader. Fortunately, he had already set up the sales organization in Manhattan. So that was all set to go. Uh, also, the sales in Europe and the sales throughout the rest of the United States was also established. So before he died, he left the company in good standing. His son, Henry Abram Lozier, the same name he had, didn't like to be called Junior. So he changed his name to Harry. So any future references are to Harry, who ran the company uh, beyond uh, the death of his father. The 1920s brought about winds of change in the automobile industry. As demand shifted towards more affordable vehicles, Lozier had to adapt. The automobile industry witnessed a significant shift in consumer preferences and economic conditions. The Roaring Twenties marked an era of rapid industrialization, technological advancements, and changing societal norms, all of which influenced the demand for automobiles. As the decade progressed, the focus of the market moved away from luxury vehicles, 
prompting Lozier to adapt to these winds of change. All these car companies, Rolls-Royce, which was introduced in 1907, Packard, Peerless, Cadillac, all of these companies wanted to be in the same category of sales and profit as the Lozier company was doing. So they all started competing and uh, Mr. Lozier was actually kicked out of the company. John Perrin left in 1913 and the company basically started unraveling at that point in time. The 1920s saw a cultural shift as the younger generation embraced a more carefree and adventurous lifestyle. The demand for sleek, stylish, and faster cars that embodied the spirit of the jazz age began to dominate the market. This preference for more dynamic and affordable vehicles posed a challenge to high-end luxury car manufacturers like Lozier. Uh, so what the company did, the board of directors decided that, that what they would do was come out with a new series of cars. They were still extremely expensive, but they did not have roller-bearing engines in them. Uh, they were able to reduce the price of the cars down, uh, one of the problems with that is that they still were more expensive than other manufacturers, but the sparkle of a car that, you, that I can afford and you can't uh, was kind of uh, done, done with. So what they decided to do was to keep the size of the automobile very similar. The amenities you would see inside, such as the beautiful uh, leather, uh, hand-polished uh, instrument panel, and so on and so forth would all be still present in the car. They replaced the, uh, the large six cylinder engine they had previously, which was three sets of two cylinder with a simpler design with two sets of three cylinder. Uh, the engine was actually larger. It's an 8.2 liter engine, which is very, very close to 500 cubic inches. So it's a massive engine, lots of power and lots of torque. So the car was still very satisfying to drive. Uh, it was comfortable, could go up and down hills with ease. Uh, the wheelbase is uh, long, it's a 130 inch wheelbase, which allowed it to have uh, it's five, uh, seven passenger seating. The 1914 model has a five passenger seating. Uh, it features hydraulic shock absorbers for a smooth ride. One of the first uh, ever used on uh, these early cars. Uh, the wheels and tires are 37 inch. On the 1914 Lozier, they're 36. This enabled the car to attain a slightly faster speed. Uh, tire diameters were bigger, which uh, again contributed to a very, very smooth ride. In conclusion, truly the 1920s were a transformative decade for the automobile industry, witnessing a shift towards mass production and more affordable vehicles. Lozier, like many other car manufacturers, had to adapt to the changing landscape by embracing innovation and catering to the evolving demands of consumers. While their luxury car production came to an end, Lozier's dedication to precision engineering and the pursuit of excellence left a lasting impact on the industry's development.